Let's crack it. Big dogs. Welcome bike to the channel. Welcome bike to the headquarters. I'm welcoming bike myself to uh, real life again. The NYC BDGE draft weekend wrapped up. Yes, I do have a black eye. We're not going to get into story time. You'll have to tune into the vlog of the weekend to find out who beat the fuck out of me. No, it was an amazing time. Shout out to everybody that came out. Uh, I'm coming back into civilization, and I spent all morning catching up on what happened in the week three of the preseason. So following this weekend's slate of games, I'm going to dive into probably five players uh, that are drastically moving up the board, five players that are drastically moving down the board in my 2021 fantasy football rankings following, again, the week three preseason slate of games. These things we've got to stay on top of. I've tried to stay on top of them as much as I possibly could for the last few weeks, but lo and behold, here we are, the final preseason game in the novels. Speaking of novels, this section uh, is in-depth, written up in the week three scripture, so in our draft guide available on bdge.store. If you've done no fucking research up to this point in your fantasy football draft preparation you honestly don't have to do anymore. Just go over to bdge.store, cop the draft guide, 2021 season long draft guide. It's got my rankings. It's got the entire Bible, exactly how to attack your draft. And then each week of the preseason updated with the scripture in that Bible. This is a little bit of the week three. Just want to give you a glimpse, want to give you a preview. Uh, we've got everything else in there. They all fade, the must draft, all that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about some guys moving up and down those boards for me following this week. If you enjoy, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you tell me that I look pretty because I'm getting a little bit insecure about the black guy. Okay, it feels weird. It's my first, uh, my first ever black guy. So it doesn't even look like a black guy. It just looks like I put a weird fucking. It looks like there's just a fly sitting on my, on the left part. All right, whatever. Fuck it. <sighs> Y'all know what to do next. Tuck your shirt in. Stop yelling. And let's eat. All right, we're going to go uh, night by night. So we had Friday, Saturday, and Sunday games, okay? And talking about night by night, we're going to be doing a live stream mock draft every single night this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, to prep you for the biggest draft weekend of the fantasy football season. So make sure that you are subscribed and make sure you put the notification bell on. It's like a little bell right below the video. So while you're down there, you know what to do. Hit that up. So uh, I believe we're going to go live at 7 p.m. Eastern time tonight. Every single night this week, we will be doing a mock draft to help you prep different draft picks, different styles, different strategies. All right. The first first thing to get out of the way here is the J.K. Dobbins injury. All right. We have a, a, a pretty decent amount of, of stuff to talk about here. He tears his ACL. They're still waiting on more x-rays or whatever to see if it's more serious we're going to look at this from a redraft season long perspective uh to get into what that means for 2021 and the baltimore ravens backfield so they will be without him for the entirety of the year and i'm gonna be honest with you i was posted up at washington square park with the, with the homies in the home mats and we were we were we were off the marks when uh when jk dobbins news hit so my stomach was already swishing around and that made it about 38 times worse so in that absence, we we obviously have Gus Edwards has been on our underrated and sleeper list for a long time in the draft guide. So, you know, hopefully you all got him scooped up and you're feeling pretty good about having Gus now. Now, Gus moves into the RB 20-ish range, okay? So you still have guys like David Montgomery and Chris Carson who I would rather have above him. Um, but he's in that he's in that range where, you, you know, you get to the back of the third round and then you see like those running backs go off the board or they're in a mix with Terry McLaurin, CeeDee Lamb, Allen Robinson, those guys. I'm still taking all those guys over Gus Edwards. Once you get into the fourth, I think you're starting to look at right around where you should be drafting him. So at the end of the day, this backfield did not have pass catching upside. And if they were going to have it this year, it was simply because J.K. Dobbins was going to be good enough to command the targets out of the backfield. So Gus Edwards steps into the starting role, of course. And there's a there's a chance that he rumbles his way into just like 12 or more touchdowns this year, the rushing touchdowns, right? Because this team just absolutely births rushing touchdowns to their backfield. So again, you know, he is the guy. He'll probably get all the goal line work. Um, Lamar Jackson will take goal line work. Lamar Jackson will take carries, whatever the case may be. But he has high touchdown upside. Problem is he's not going to catch passes. 
he's going to have a very, very solid floor. My concern is like that's all that Gus Edwards is is really going to have. Okay, so Dobbins technically, in, in my opinion, had some sort of league winning upside just because he's young, primed, explosive, uh, good pass catcher. Do, uh, Gus Edwards simply just does not really have that, in my opinion. The other problem is this: the Ravens really over the last few years have done nothing to suggest that they won't be using a running back by committee. Now, the, the the conversation gets interesting because we don't know what the RB2 position is going to hold, right? At first, you might be like, oh, it's got to be Justice Hill. This guy is wildly explosive. He's been on the team for a couple of years. He made Chris Carson ride the bench at Oklahoma State. Uh, but after two years of being with Baltimore, they clearly like don't have a lot of confidence. They clearly don't see him as a big-time role player in this offense. And, you know, you might think grabbing Hill late in fantasy drafts is the sharp play, but Lee Corso's coming in here and hit you with that fucking not so fast. All right. Because we got some dude, we got some dude named Tyson Williams, Tyson Williams. I have no fucking idea who that was prior to Saturday. And I've done a lot of research in the scripture. I have some links to articles that you can check out. And basically, when you look at Tyson Williams, like, He has an intriguing profile. It's almost like a poor man's Gus Edwards, to be honest with you. Really solid size, 5'11", 220. He's an undrafted free agent, nearly 25 years old. Really good speed score, though, for his size. Right, 220 pounds, he runs a 4'5", So that's what we like about it. Part that we don't like about it is uh, we're not actually sure that he is any good at football, okay? Because Williams uh, was in college from 2015 all the way through 2019. He transferred multiple times, two times, North Carolina, South Carolina, BYU, was never able to command more than 95 carries in a season, never able to command more than 12 receptions in a single season, all right? And you could sit here and start making excuses as to like, you know, you transfer and it start, uh, you transfer multiple times. It's really hard to, to grasp a starting role in an offense when you're moving around so much. And there were other, you know, NFL running backs, Rico Dowdle on uh, on the rosters and stuff. So how how can we expect him to really win a workhorse role at any point? But when, as soon as you find yourself, I think this is just the fantasy note in general. As soon as you find yourself um, really getting into the weeds of excuses, it, it more often than not turns into mistakes, right? Excuses turns into mistakes when it comes to drafting and fantasy football. My opinion, though, I like Williams's athletic profile enough to give him a late round shot. Um, you know, if you miss on Gus or whatever, Gus in the fourth, fifth round, Tyson Williams, Tyson, I don't know. I haven't heard anyone actually say his name. So I think it's Tyson because it's got an apostrophe. So I apologize to any uh, to anyone who somehow fucking takes that personally. Someone out there will. Um, if your name is Tyson, let me know how we pronounce that. That'd be wonderful. I would also really like to have a friend named Tyson. At this point, I'd really like to have any friend. I'm just kidding, y'all. Let's go. Let's fucking go. Let's wrap back up. Tyson, Tyson, Tyson. Uh, yeah, he's he's athletic enough to intrigue me. Um, at this point, here's the thing. There there was a, an article that came out from someone at ESPN, Jameson Henley, who follows the Ravens. Straight up in this article on ESPN.com, Edwards' backup is Tyson Williams, a second-year player out of BYU who leapfrogged Justice Hill on the depth chart. Williams impressed the Ravens with his physicality. So we're hearing straight up. Like, this is not just me. The, the only reason we're going nuts about this is because of this report, right? Like, we're hearing straight up from someone who covers the team that – Clearly, it's not like a battle for the number two role. He just straight up said Tyson Williams is the backup to Gus Edwards, and he has jumped Justice Hill on the depth chart. Now, they're a little bit different in terms of like stature, obviously, and and playing style, and he's a little bit more explosive, Justice Hill is. So it's possible that this is a three running back by committee. Um, That being said, like I'm not going to go super high on either of the backups. I will take one or the other, whoever's sitting there in the 13th, 14th, 15th round. Not expecting much out of those guys. Gus Edwards, again, going to get a lot of volume in this offense. So he is like a a, a lowish RB2, mid to low RB2, missing upside just because he's not going to catch a lot of passes. Uh, If you're in dynasty leagues, though, I would blow all my fab on Tyson and Justice Hill. Either of them are available. I would actually in Dynasty probably take Justice Hill over uh, Williams. These are the, and the reason I say that is because if you do offseason fab, right, all the leagues that I play in, we get $100 at the start of the offseason, resets at the beginning of the regular season. Um, So that being said, if you have any offseason fab left, I'm blowing it all on these running backs because here's the thing. Anytime there's a chance where a running back gets an opportunity to be a player in an NFL offense that's not rostered in a Dynasty league, assuming we're talking about real normal dynasty leagues that have 24, 26, 28, 30 team rosters. Um, these are the guys that you want to stash at the end of your bench that get opportunities because the upside of of somehow scooping up starting running back off waivers 
is it just outweighs the risk so far. It's like it's like how animal outweighs Tutu Atwell. Like that's how far the discrepancy is in outweighing shit here. So you always blow fab on the uh, the running backs that have a chance to playing time on different teams. All right, let's move into the games. Let's talk about Friday's slate. Uh, I'm going to run through this stuff really, really, really quickly. Basically, what I have written up in the scriptures. So, T.Y. Hilton is hurt. Again, he is completely off your draft board. Now that we're looking at the Colts' offense, we see Carson Wentz. We see Quentin Nelson, both likely to be back for week one, which makes me a lot happier drafting Jonathan Taylor. Michael Pittman goes from a guy I was kind of like iffy about, but I feel a little bit better with T.Y. Hilton probably going to miss some time and linger and all that kind of shit. So, Michael Pittman moving up. In my draft board a little bit, uh, he's a guy that I think definitely has sleeper, definitely has some underrated appeal to him as someone that's going to be forced into the wide receiver one their role there in Indy. Uh, in Detroit, speaking of wide receiver ones, they don't fucking have one now that they cut Rashad Perriman, which kind of hurts because I have a lot of exposure to him in underdog. But he's cut, uh, and honestly, you're just staying away from everybody else on that team in the receiving group. Tyrell Williams is hurt. Uh, Amon Ross St. Brown is still struggling to find his way onto the field. He's barely playing in three wide receiver sets. Quintus, C- Quintus Cephas. It's like a poor man's Russell Gage is playing over him. The only the only passing part of this offense I really want outside of uh, DeAndre Swift is TJ Hawkinson. For real, for real, for real. And talking about guys that we absolutely do not want is Michael Carter. He continues to be drafted as the first New York running back off the board. The only time he's even playing as a backup in this offense is when either Ty Johnson or Tevin Coleman are not playing. Okay, It is Tevin Coleman, it is Ty Johnson, and it is Michael Carter. He is continuously seeing second string snaps. He's not playing with the first team at all. Guys, you need to be drafting Ty Johnson and then Tevin Coleman and then Michael Carter. Michael Carter's upside is it's not there right now. Okay, so stop drafting him in the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth round. The other guys are playing. They're starting. They're getting way more run than Michael Carter is. He's not playing on passing downs. Like whatever you thought about him as a player at UNC, he still very well might be that player talent wise. But right now he is in a running back by committee. He's the third player in the running back by committee. And this is a committee that is not going to have a lot of touchdown opportunity upside. So fade. Michael Carter, absolutely on the all-fade list. Terrace Marshall, very, very interesting. He just continues to be that guy that we drafted him to be. Super young, but just absolutely balling out this preseason. What I will say is temper expectations. Don't start drafting him in the eighth, ninth round. Uh, He's someone that I'm still looking at 13th, 14th, 15th round, okay? And if you can't get him there, don't worry about not getting him because he's still the third wide receiver on this depth chart, okay? Uh, and that could still be a good thing, right? He's behind Robbie. They extended him, so you know they they still like Robbie. DJ Moore is simply way too good for him to be benched at this point. Um... But the the Panthers under Joe Brady last year played on three wide receiver or more sets personnel at a rate of 66% of the time. Something like there. Who's counting? Besides fucking me. Um, Terrace Marshall will be on the field for, you know, 60% of the snaps. You tell me what that means to you. He has Sam Donald throwing the ball. So he's looked great. But uh, I will say just like temper expectations, again, he's a rookie. That's the third string on the um on the field and then if you're drafting Najee Harris in the first I would I would suggest drafting Anthony McFarland in the 15th round last round or whatever um, because no one else is going to draft him in your league but if you have Najee Harris Anthony McFarland seems to be the clear handcuff here played all the second string snaps throughout the preseason and uh, they rested all their starters this week along with Anthony McFarland which should tell you that he is there Nicole Hardman's been the speculation of a lot of talk this offseason, per me, he's been on the all-fade list. And he will stay there. I know he started over Demarcus Robinson, but he continues to split snaps into wide receiver sets with Robinson. It's like it, it really is a committee on the outside, and I'm just going to fade it all together. All right, so to wrap up Friday, let's uh, we can hit you with another devastating injury to a player in purple, and that is Irv Smith, who had been, uh, who had been on our uh, sleeper underrated breakout list in the draft guide. He tears his meniscus. And at this moment, we don't know the severity of it. We do know that um, he will be out a minimum of four to five weeks. If it is a serious torn meniscus and they have to do some sort of serious surgery on it, uh, there is worst case scenario that he is out for the entirety of the season. You hate to see that. This does actually make Tyler Conklin extremely, extremely intriguing because he got really involved down the stretch last year when Kyle Rudolph was out. We know Kyle Rudolph is gone to New York right now. So Tyler Conklin honestly moves up to, I think I have him at tight end 17 in my rankings. If we hear that Irv Smith is going to be back in in four weeks or whatever, I'll move him down a little bit. But Tyler Conklin is an underrated athletic tight end that we've seen already produce on the NFL football field. Um, That we've seen 
on the NFL football field produce already. And this is such a highly funneled passing offense, right? They have two receivers. They have a running back and a tight end. Like that is, it, it seems year over year, no matter who is at the tight end position, they produce in fantasy. So I like Tyler Conklin. I like him like just as much as I like an Adam Troutman. Definitely like him more than the guys like Jared Cook and Cole Komet and, and, and those type of players, even though I'm getting a little bit higher on Cole Komet. But Tyler Conklin is, is a very intriguing guy later on in the draft um, with the Irv Smith news. But going into the year, since Irv Smith is going to miss pretty significant time, he's pretty much off my board altogether. Moving into the Saturday slate, the backfield for Buffalo is an absolute fucking mess. We saw Josh Allen finally, you know, play significant time this weekend, and he didn't throw it. He didn't run the ball. The Bills didn't run the ball a single play in the first quarter. Devin Singletary took all the first first quarter snaps. Zach Moss took all the second quarter snaps with Allen on the field. Uh, This is just going to be so pass heavy. None of these running backs are going to get a lot of carries. It's going to be a running back by committee. I still like Zach Moss the most, but he's moving down my board a little bit, whereas uh, Devin Singletary continues to just be a guy that I don't really want any part of. Of for Buffalo, Emmanuel Sanders. I know Gabriel Davis had a big game, but guys, he's barely playing in. Uh, he, he's getting on the field in four wide receiver sets. He's getting a little bit of time in three wide receiver sets. Emmanuel Sanders is 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 the wide receiver two there, and I I still am telling you that Sanders is going to be very very underrated and very very good for fantasy this year. Again, this is a passing offense that didn't run the ball once in the first quarter. It doesn't even matter if he ends up being the wide receiver three, which he's not going to be. Uh, he'll, he's going to see a ton of targets, man. I really, really like Emmanuel Sanders. Let's keep on moving. Um, yeah, I mean, Mark Andrews moves up my board. He's easily a top five tight end right now with all the injuries to Baltimore. Dobbins, Bateman, Marquise. Gronk is playing full time with the starters, man. And I continue to say that, you know, OJ Howard is not 100% from his Achilles. Cameron Braid is not playing at all with the starters. Uh, so if you're buying into pieces of this passing offense, stop paying up for Evans and Godwin. Continue to pay late round prices for Antonio Brown and Rob Gronkowski. Don't pay late round prices for Gerald Everett. As much as we're trying to, and I had him on my sleeper list this year, he has been moved off the sleeper list. We are trying to force athleticism into NFL production. He's now 27 years old and it's not happening. And now he's splitting time with Will Disley. This is going to be a committee at tight end in Seattle. And we just really haven't seen bursts of uh, tight end greatness in Seattle in a long time. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just not really, I'd take Tyler Conklin over Everett right now to be completely honest with you. And moving over to the Sunday slate of games. This is kind of exactly why I hesitate to rank James Robinson within like arm's reach of the top 15 fantasy running back. He's right there. Like it's like James Robinson and Gus Edwards are there together. Um, and, and one dichotomy I would say is like, okay, so you have James Robinson, Gus Edwards, Damian Harris. I would probably rank it James Robinson, Gus Edwards, Damian Harris in that in that order. But they're all kind of within the same tier. Robinson is likely to see the most passing down work. But as you can see, like the snap counts are going to be close. Carlos Hyde, does he deserve to play a lot in this backfield? No. But is he going to? Yeah, he's going to be wildly fucking annoying for James Robinson owners for whatever reason. OK, uh, speaking with the Jags, I had LaVisca Chenault on the all fade list. I moved him off the all fade list. OK, uh, simply he's just looked too good. He's been too involved in the preseason with Trevor Lawrence under center. Uh, and maybe that's doing part to literally everybody being hurt on this offense. DJ Chark, Marvin Jones, Travis Etienne. Uh, but it doesn't matter at this point. Right. And one of the key things that I was fading was the fact that Visca is probably not going to play on three wide receiver sets or not going to play unless it's three wide receiver sets. Still very much the case. He is still only playing in two wide receiver sets, which does cap his ceiling. There are going to be games when, for whatever reason, they go two tight end set heavy. But right now, they're not playing that much in that formation with Trevor Lawrence under center. So it doesn't seem to be as high of a concern. He's going to be really involved on the snaps that he is playing. But again, very, very important to note that... Um, LaVisca is still not playing in three, uh, two wide receiver sets. It's so fucking weird and not going to be helped when Jones and Chark come back on the field. Uh, he has a very, very weird path to getting on the field there, which is stupid, but um, it is what it is. I, I, I like LaVisca a lot more now than I did early on in the preseason. And speaking of that running back group, right, we covered Gus Edwards. We covered uh, James Robinson for a second. Damian Harris is last ranked. It is clear as day what this Patriots backfield is going to do for the for possibly the first time ever in fantasy football. Uh, you know, despite the preseason MVP, Ramondre Stevenson just absolutely running up a touchdown tab. He's literally not playing a single snap with the starters, guys. He is not going to make an impact this year. Damian Harris is taking every single first and second down snap with the starters. James White is monopolizing the third down snap. So we know what the 
rotation is. It's it's extremely, extremely clear. It's Damian Harris, it's James White, it's James White, it's Damian Harris, it's Damian Harris, it's James White. Stop trying to create narratives for Ramondre Stevenson, who I was higher on than fucking anybody in the offseason uh, for rookie and dynasty drafts, but he's not playing at all with the starters, okay, guys? He's not going to have a role this year. And lastly, and the biggest fucking waste of breath is just don't draft John Brown on the Raiders. Okay, that's all I got for y'all today. I have to hop on a call with our editors because we have about 200 clips from this weekend's vlog that we need to organize and figure out how the fuck we make this thing happen. But I cannot wait to drop that vlog. Uh, The weekend was so much fucking fun. I hope some of y'all guys will maybe consider joining next year if we have any room, if we have any dropouts, which might not be likely after how well this one went. But uh, I just wanted to get you guys something out for Monday because it is that time. Drafts are rapidly approaching and uh, and y'all need to know the scoop. If you want everything in depth, guys, uh, just go look no further than bdge.store. Bdge.store. Draft guide. Cop it. Rankings. All fade. Must draft. Sleepers. Undervalued. Underrated. Under everything. Bible. Scriptures. It's all there for you. Bdge.store. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. Thumbs up if you enjoyed. I love y'all. 